Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rich Corsi, and it's my pleasure and honor to serve as Dean of the University of California Davis College of Engineering and to welcome all of you to the National Academy of Engineering Regional Meeting on our Tensions at the Edge Symposium. And before we begin today, let me take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land at UC Davis has been the home of Pukwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Pukwin tribes. Cachil Dihi Band of Wintun Indians in the Palouse Indian community, Quetzal Dihi Wintun Nation, and the Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. The Pukwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It's been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. On behalf of UC Davis and the College of Engineering, I want to thank the National Academy of Engineering for their partnership in hosting today's event. We're fortunate to have several NAE leaders in attendance today. Among them is Dr. John L. Anderson, the president of the National Academy of Engineering. Prior to the NAE, Dr. Anderson served as the president of the Illinois Institute of Technology, or IIT, where he was also a distinguished professor of chemical engineering. Before IIT, Dr. Anderson held positions in academia at various institutions, serving as the provost and executive vice president of Case Western Reserve <coughs> University, the Dean of the College of Engineering and Head of the Chemical Engineering Department at Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Anderson was elected to the NAE in 1992 for contributions to the understanding of colloidal hydrodynamics and membrane transport phenomena. In the NAE, Dr. Anderson has served as an NAE counselor on various committees. Um, his service extends to other National Academies activities as well. In addition to his NAE membership, Dr. Anderson is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Dr. Anderson has also served on the National Science Board and received many awards for his contributions to the engineering field, including the National Engineering Award from the American Association of Engineering Societies. So please join in welcoming Dr. John L. Anderson. So we try to inspire young people to get into the field from all over society. We emphasize two points, creativity and teamwork. Uh, teamwork and creativity. So, and we also play this loud because we want the young people to, to remember it. So, welcome to the uh, <coughs> regional meeting at the University of California Davis. As I know, we'll note this is the fourth meeting this year we've had, a regional meeting in the United States. Um, and we're talking about tensions. Tensions uh, meaning there's no silver bullet, everything can be used in multiple ways. Everything's connected in some way, and uh, <clears throat> and I'm looking forward to the talks. I want to congratulate uh, Razor for a great job of putting together the symposium here, and uh, looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Um, I thought I'd start off. I was encouraged to give you my def my definition of the difference between scientists and engineers, and uh, it was by a story I heard that uh, scientists and engineer were good friends and they would like to go hiking and one day they were out, a beautiful day in the mountains around here and uh, hiked and then they pitched a tent and they were talking, they made dinner and argued about various this and that. Finally, they, they went into the tent and went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, the engineer bumps the, the uh, scientist and says, wake up. And the scientist says, yes, look up. And he says, the scientist looks up. The engineer says, what do you see? The scientist says, I see a beautiful sky with millions of stars. The engineer says, what does that tell you? And the scientist says, well, there's millions of stars, there's millions of galaxies, and perhaps billions of planets. It tells me I can see that uh, Saturn is in Leo, and it's clear, and tomorrow's going to be a beautiful day, we're going to have a great day. And then the scientist turns to the engineer and, and asks, what does it tell you? And he said, somebody stole our tent. <laughs> so it is the difference of science and engineering. And that's your answer right there. Okay. Going here. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, something about the National Academy of Engineering. I'm proud to co-sponsor this uh, uh, symposium with uh, C. Davis. Um, we uh, have, as you can see, roughly 2,400 U.S. members and over 300 international members. 
we're, we're uh, uh, divided into, not divided, but we're grouped into sections, but we're really one organization. But those sections involve the various disciplines of the chemical, civil, computer science, and so on. Um, Fifty percent of our members are elected, who are elected every year, out of the 110 or so, are from industry. And that makes us different than the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, because roughly zero percent of them are elected from industry. So we bring an industrial uh, business perspective to the academy. So it's very important, especially from the government's point of view. Our greatest asset would be to be best and brightest minds to attack problems of uh, facing society. Um, the motto I, I borrowed from Wes Harris, who is our vice president, is a professor at MIT. We do great things and we do good things. And the good things I'm talking about are the good things for society and the social awareness. And we talk about that today in our meeting. Social awareness is should come into engineering as a, for all of us thinking about what we do, are we doing the right things uh, for society. Now, we have three buildings. Uh, one is, uh, the one on the left is in on Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C. That's the main one. Some of you have been to that building. And uh, call that the NAS building, uh, finished in 1924, funded by Andrew Carnegie. Second middle building is Keck Building. That's three miles away in Washington, D.C., and that was completed around the year 2000. And many of our studies are, are, are performed in uh, that, that building. And the third one is the Beckman Center on the campus of Irvine, the University of California, Irvine. And we had meetings out there several times a year. Now, our mission is twofold. One is to provide advice to the government and to the public about matters that involve uh, engineering and uh, technology. And uh, <clears throat> the second one is we promote the engineering profession. And what we're doing today is part of that promotion of the engineering profession, uh, working with the University of California at Davis. Now, um, I'm going to talk about a couple things we do in terms of programs. We have, uh, we're in Washington, D.C., so we have to use acronyms. These are what that means, letters that no one can understand. Okay. Uh, so let me tell you what I think, uh, what I think they mean. Peer means education. Are we doing the best we can in educating engineers? Caesar means social awareness, something that didn't happen when I was a student, but now in, within our universities, we're, telling, we're working with students to ask are we social aware of uh, when we uh, design new, new uh, operations or artifacts or whatever. The third is focus, uh, which is I think is systems, uh, complex systems, and going back to the roots of the working on systems, where things are interrelated, and when you do this, this symposium, you're kind of connected to that piece, because when you work in a system, sometimes you do something to one part of the system, and it affects another part in a negative way. And the fourth one is idea with two E's, and that's really about inclusion, including all our society, including all our members, including our members and the things we do, welcoming their advice and making everyone uh, uh, committed and part of the, the organization. So that's what, that's what those initials really stand for. And as an example of idea, we have something called Engineer Girl. How many of you are aware of Engineer Girl? It's aimed at, it's a program that's now 23 years, I believe, in operation. And it is aimed at girls in sixth to eighth grade to interest them in engineering, through team activities, through solving problems, uh, to creating new things, to looking at the, the uh, careers of successful women who, who are engineers. It's a great, 
website, and if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go. It's one word, Engineer Girl, just Google it, and you'll get to that site, and you can see what's going on. Lots of things on that site. The second uh, program we have, which is very popular, is called Frontiers of Engineering. And some of you out there have participated in this program, and it is uh, aimed at engineers in academic university, uh, business and uh, government, roughly between the ages of 30 and 45, up and rising uh, leaders in those fields. And they get together and they pick four themes at a, at a meeting and give to the talks given on those themes. And this, this is a very, very successful program. If any of you are asked to be involved in it, uh, please take, take the opportunity. And, uh, and I find it extremely interesting. The, uh, and I love to attend the meetings. In a way, the, the regional meeting is like the Frontiers program. You know, people get up and speak and talk about the future, and uh, so we need more of that. Now, some of you may know Janet Hunziker, who founded that program in 1995. She's retired this year, after uh, all those years. And uh, a new person named uh, Vernon Dunn has taken over. Janet gave us a great foundation on Frontiers of Engineering. Now, NEE, in concert with the other uh, two academies and the National Research Council, does studies of, uh, related to issues facing the government and the public. And some examples are given here. Um, I'll draw your attention to the right-hand side on health. That's a study on uh, particulates uh, and health and in, in indoor pollution, basically. That was chaired by Dean Corsi here, uh, and, and it's been very uh, in demand, let's say. It was funded, I think, by the government, by uh, NSF, was it, or EPA? EPA, funded by EPA. And that's one of our most successful consensus studies. Thank Dean Corsi for, for leading that one as well. I mean, the one second to the right, the second to the right is laying the foundations for small modular reactors. There's a revolution going on in nuclear reactors to make them small, modular, safe, uh, less expensive, and so on. But we have a long way to go. I'll make a statement that I think most of my colleagues at least the National Academy agree with, and that is, without nuclear energy, we're not going to get anywhere close to net zero carbon in, in, uh, in the next 30 or 40 years. So we've got to do some things with nuclear energy, and this is talks about a wonderful study um, the, um, then you see two other studies that, that we have there, uh, that, that one on climate change and the other one on the pandemic. Um, these studies are published by the National Academies Press. Uh, the National Academies, the National Academies is everywhere, all three academies plus the NRC. And you can download the studies for free. You get a PDF, they're typically about three megabytes, so it's easy to download. And if you're interested in any of these studies, you can easily get the study. Now recently, because climate change is probably the greatest challenge that all of us in this room are going to face over the next several decades, that uh, we started something called Climate Crossroads, which in the university we call a center. But in the National Academy, they didn't really have something called a center, so it's called Climate Crossroads. And this connects all the seven working groups of the National Research Council, plus the three academies, the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, National Academy of Medicine. And uh, <coughs> we are pulling together our expertise. And you know that this climate change is interesting because it really connects the technical with the non-technical. Because changes, decarbonization, all these things will require social changes. And that means social scientists play a big role as we move towards zero net carbon economy or very low carbon economy. So the climate crossroads you'll see a lot more of, and I think uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, something many of you will be involved in, I hope, uh, as we go forward. So let me close with another video. Uh, we've become big on videos. I actually am more of a visual person, so I like to see things instead of reading. And uh, so here's one that deals with our interests in the National Academies on addressing climate change. Calling all big thinkers. 
The world's climate is changing. These aren't new facts, but it means we must think in new ways about how we can live, prosper, and provide energy for our world while protecting our planet. Engineers are answering the call to create solutions that decrease our dependence on fossil fuels and unlock new ideas, new technologies, new innovations to power our world. Taking lessons from the best engineer out there, nature, engineers are creating cleaner, safer, and reliable energy. Solar power, harnessing the power of the sun to light all corners of the globe. Wind power, channeling a simple breeze to bring electricity to our homes. Hydropower, using the natural flow of water to generate electricity. Nuclear power, engineering advanced reactors that are safer, more reliable, and produce zero carbon emissions. As our climate becomes unstable, we look to the sustainable. There is no single solution. It takes teamwork. Engineers continuously discover new ways to increase efficiency, reduce adverse effects, and make clean, safe, reliable energy that is accessible to all. Engineers are leading the way, engaging communities, and empowering the next generation. Engineers answer the call. So, another thank you. Thanks to our communications department, and uh, one of our members, India, is here. Where is India? She, she's back there. She's our communications person, and she's involved in many of these things. So, thank you, India. You know, this is about visibility and what engineers can do, and you uh, get a little bit. I'm not very happy with using the word problem solving all the time. I like the word creativity better, being creative. And uh, that's what Von Karman, you know, Von Karman said, engineers create what never was. It's, and I think we're going to keep that in mind as we try to encourage young people to pursue engineering. So these things are intended for visibility and to uh, recruit the best talent we can into, into the engineering profession. Also, the, the, uh, as I said before, it's not just about the technical, the social is important, we have to keep that in mind as we go forward. I think today we're going to hear some of that as well, in terms of uh, balancing the uh, trade-offs and so on. Let me finish then with uh, the slide of the regional meetings. You can see that this is the fourth one. We've been to Purdue, Texas A&M, uh, University of Delaware, and now University of California. Davis. And the purpose of these meetings is to uh, make the engineering room more visible, connect with our members and the members, and also to show off what's being done at the host institutions. So we're going to talk to do that. A very good opportunity, and I think we're all going to be extremely impressed. So I want to thank everyone at University of California Davis. It's, it's helped us out here. Great, a great experience so far. And I think it's now time for me to turn it over to. Oh, the theme was here. Thank you. I will say that there, our meeting is much better than the other Aggie meeting that's happened this year. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. And on a personal note, thank you for acknowledging the consensus study report on indoor. Well, in particular matter, it couldn't have happened without the NAE putting together an all-star committee and also providing all-star staff that kind of carried us across the finish line, so thank you. All right, once again, we are, oops, I guess I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, once again, we're so pleased to host you today for what I guarantee will be an impressive showcase of unique and innovative perspectives on entering solutions to societies most pressing problems. As Dean of the UC Davis College of Engineering and proud of leading college committed to engineering a better world for all. And now I can say, do great things, do good things along with that. Our next level strategic vision for research, education, and community is the framework for, by which we leverage our strengths to tackle the world's most pressing problems. And the strategic research vision that we have includes four major research impact areas. One is advancing human health, 
the second, revolutionizing energy systems, the third, strengthening climate resilience, and the fourth, transforming mobility. Throughout these impact areas, we employ and develop intelligent systems and automation, create and utilize tools at the nano and micro scales, and are committed to the concept of engineering for all, a concept that's very, very dear to my heart, to leave no community behind, to develop accessible engineering solutions that improve the quality of life for all. Our community of talented faculty and researchers embodies these commitments, and we're investing in their research endeavors by funding bold ideas that align with our strategic research vision. Since the launch of our research vision just two years ago, we've given Next Level Research Awards for 18 interdisciplinary projects. You'll hear about some of those projects today. The college welcomed 18 amazing new faculty members to our community just this year. These really are rock star faculty we're hiring. Uh, they're key contributors as we go toward greater expertise in our research impact areas. In fact, 22 of our early career faculty members have received prestigious NSF career awards in just the past four years, and that would make any dean of engineering at any university in the United States uh, very, very proud, and it does. The College of Engineering community also includes a fair number of National Academy of Engineering members, including Ameri faculty. Our newest inductees are Jennifer Sinclair. Uh, Curtis, Jennifer, are you here? No, she was here last night. Uh, Jay Lund, Dan Sperley, who I can see straight ahead of me, so we want to acknowledge them. It's also worth celebrating uh, our college's research expenditures, which continue to just continue to soar and reach new heights year after year after year. In 2023, our research expenditures approach $700,000 per faculty member in one year. And you may have heard that UC Davis exceeded $1 billion in external research awards in the past two years, which puts our university amongst really a special club amongst universities in the United States. Uh, UC Davis was recently ranked number six public university in the US, the number one greenest campus in the United States for eight consecutive years, and top five university in the world for sustainability now for 10 consecutive years. Sustainability runs in our blood, in our college, and our university. I'm very proud of the College of Insurance contributions to these rankings. And while we strive to lead in research, we're also deeply committed to enhancing diversity and access in the engineering field. I'm particularly proud of a new program we have called eSearch. It's a program that pairs PhD student mentors with uh, primarily lower division first generation college student mentees to work on a 10 week research project that uh, is doomed to success. We want our students to be inspired. This early exposure inspires students to explore the real world impacts of research and pathways to graduate school. One participant, I just want to quote one participant in that program, a first-year undergraduate woman of color, first-year student, explained to me after her experience, I never knew what a PhD was, and now I definitely want to be one. So this is a program that really does inspire our early, early uh, undergraduate students. I'm thrilled to know that while we're growing our research enterprise, we're also identifying and investing in future leaders in the engineering field. In just a few minutes, you get to hear directly from our faculty about how they are approaching tensions at the edge, but first, I'm very excited to introduce the UC Davis Vice Chancellor of Research, Dr. Simon Atkinson. Vice Chancellor Atkinson joined UC Davis this fall after serving as Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of Kansas. And prior to his role at KU, he was Vice Chancellor for Research at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and Associate Vice President for Research for Indiana University with system wide responsibility for innovation and commercialization. As a molecular cell biologist, Vice Chancellor Atkinson is internationally recognized for his studies in the prevention and treatment of acute kidney injuries that can be triggered by heart failure, cardiac surgery, toxins, and contrast agents that are used in diagnostic tests. We're thrilled to have him at the helm of the UC Davis Office of Research. Please welcome Vice Chancellor Simon Atkinson. So I am uh, very honored to, to be here, and it's a great honor to have this, this meeting at, at, at UC Davis. You, you've heard about, a lot about the, the, the research accomplishments of the, of the university from, from Dean Corsi, um, so I, I won't reiterate those. What I will say is, is just something about the culture of the university. I, I, I'm, I'm new here really since November. Um, 
And what I've observed about the university as a whole and the College of Engineering in particular is the collaborative culture that, that, that exists here. And um, so I, I, think, I think the theme of this meeting is, is particularly appropriate for, for a meeting held at, at UC Davis. And it reflects the strength of the, the, of the institution, these collaborations to, um, to, to meet the grand challenges of our, of our, of our time. In, in climate solutions, in dealing with the next pa pandemic, in reimagining the way the university works to be a more accessible and inclusive community for, for those that, that can benefit from, from participating in what we do. So, um, I, I, with, with that, I, I, I think I'm going to lead it to the much more interesting part of the program, which is the, 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 the reason we are here. Um, is, is, is to, to hear about um, some of the innovative things going on and to fill out this uh, really compelling theme that, that's, that's been articulated for, the, for this meeting. So, so thank you for, for having me here. Thank you for allowing me to say a few words. And now, now on with the fun.
theory and translation. Um, we want to optimize trade-offs, as I already said. We have to make decisions that are in, with incomplete information and time-scale considerations. One thing I study is cascading failures. I know that you can suppress cascades very effectively, but eventually a massive cascade is going to come and overwhelm your system. So perhaps under my watch, I'm going to try and suppress cascades at all costs, but I'm going to leave a very vulnerable system to my predecessor. Um, and of course, as engineers and scientists, we go really deep because we want to understand the foundations and the technical uh, details. And that means sometimes we can't see the full landscape, the unintended consequences that come from our technologies. So our goal today is to leave with a better understanding of the system that we live in and the different competing objectives and stakeholders. Just to get real concrete for a minute, let's think about tensions in renewable energy. So this is a beautiful installation in the Mojave Desert, which is providing massive amounts of power, but it's got some flip sides to it, too. So residents feel trapped and choked by dust, and experts warn that environmental damage is solving one problem by creating another. So as we're deploying solar, which is an important part of our resilient <coughs> ecosystem, we also have to worry about the um, ecosystem itself and public health, housing market dynamics, the transmission problem, we're generating the electricity not where people are demanding it, we have to transport it, it's not very efficient, and cybersecurity, which is increasingly a concern with the grid. And China built more solar panels in 2023 than the entire world did in 2022. I also really wanted to briefly mention tensions in artificial intelligence, because you can't have a symposium without talking about AI, and we'll certainly have more going deep into that. Um, machine learning is one of the main focuses of artificial intelligence these days, but I just wanted to put that Venn diagram up there to remind us that it's only a subset. There's also things like symbolic logic that's very important. And everyone these days is very focused on large language models and generative pre-trained transformers, and that's even a smaller part of machine learning. So just to remind us. And we're deploying artificial intelligence faster than our understanding. Um, we have a lot of biases in all of the training corpora that we use for machine learning algorithms. It's a big software engineering program. There's always errors and uh, unintended uh, properties. The black box nature of machine learning, data privacy and cybersecurity. We can't forget the environmental impact, all of the data centers and the air conditioning and electricity required, and the cost to develop these large language models in particular means that universities can't be competitive. We don't have the resources to do it. And there's, of course, international regulatory frameworks. No nation can go it alone. And we have to think about the impact on human society, like workforce retraining, and do we really want to turn over our society to a handful of Silicon Valley companies? Um, tensions in engineering life cycle is another thing that we're going to be hearing about today concurrent engineering of food, water, and material systems, and planetary boundaries that put constraints on just how far we can take things. And there's a lot of additional tensions that we're going to explore, building health, climate engineering, electric vehicles, the modern role of academia and research, how we're going to deliver water to the state of California in a changing climate, and feeding a growing planet. So a lot of exciting things uh, that we have ahead. And of course, we're also going to focus on solutions. So we'll have a series of flash talks talking about I really innovative work that our faculty are doing. So our goals for today are to learn of cutting edge engineering to solve societal problems, to map out the tensions involving the unintended consequences, the multiple stakeholders, the competing objectives, and the system level integration needed, and finally, to be inspired to tackle grand societal changes. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. And apologies, but I forgot my notes. So our, we'll have a series of three overview talks. Each one will be 15 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes for questions afterwards. Then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back for our flash talks and our panel discussion. So our first presenter is Vinod Narayanan. He's a professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering and the Associate Director of the UC Davis Western Cooling Efficiency Center. His areas of research interest include microscale flow and heat transfer, phase change heat transfer, energy efficiency, solar thermal energy, flow and thermal diagnostics, and 
of dental management. His research has been sponsored by a wide variety of agencies like the National Science Foundation, NASA, Department of Engineering, Office of Naval Research, and the Australian Research Council. He's won numerous awards and recognition, including the NSF Career Award and the Outstanding Leadership Award from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Vinod holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Texas, and we are really excited for his presentation today. Thank you.